The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another ATRA uh, webinar. Uh, today's webinar is going to be sponsored by Seal Aftermarket Products, and we'd like to thank them for sponsoring all our webinars to make them free to everyone uh, as far as ATRA members or non-members. Here's a short video on their product. Seal Aftermarket Products engineers and manufactures Toledo Transkit with all the extra components you need to get the job done right. Toledo Transkit includes aftermarket fixes engineered by expert rebuilding technicians with enhanced component materials and key original equipment, gaskets and seals. When servicing Honda and Acura transmissions, shaft nuts are quite often damaged during removal. Toledo Transkit provides all the main shaft, secondary shaft, and counter shaft nuts so you don't have to try to reuse the originals or pay extra for them at the dealer. Honda Acura kits also include valve body screen filters, pressure tap washers, and other important components like bolt locks, roll pins, and pistons. If you want the best sealing transmission kit in the industry, ask for Toledo Transkit by name. Okay, I really like using their kits, having all those extras in there. Don't have to go out and try to find them and purchase them. Uh, they come in real handy. If you have any questions or comments uh, about the webinars, please send the, your emails to webinars at atra.com. If you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to go ahead and text them to me, and I will answer those the best way that I can. Today's presentation, we will be discussing the Lineatronic CVT. This is the introduction uh, to the Lineatronic. Later on in the uh, next few weeks, we will be doing the uh, internal parts as far as uh, disassembling and seeing all the internal parts to this transmission. The Lineatronic CVT is an automatic, continuous, variable, all-wheel drive uh, transaxle. It's it's elongated. It goes in the long way in the, in the vehicle. It doesn't go in like the usual transaxle that we see that are transversed. The transmission provides in a, a stepless change in ratios, starting out at about 2.37 to 1 to as high as 0.39 to 1 in the overdrive range. Uh, they boast about uh, putting this transaxle behind their new sporty boxer engine. And as you can see, it comes in also all-wheel drive. Here are the vehicles that are found with this uh, transaxle in it. You'll see some of them are actually listed for Europe. There are actually two versions to this transmission. There's the Gen 1, which Subaru refers to as the TR690. And then there's a Gen 2, which is referred to as a TR580. The Gen 2 is a little bit smaller, about 100 millimeters shorter. It's about 15% lighter than the Gen 1. For the most part, in this webinar, we're going to be covering the Gen 1 model. We will be showing some uh, comparisons to the Gen 2. This is kind of what they look like side by side. You can see they pretty much uh, look the same. Uh, other than actual size, if you had them side by side, could you really tell the difference? There are six major differences between the Gen 2 in comparison to the Gen 1. The forward and reverse shift mechanism, as they call it, which is the forward and reverse clutches, uh, they're on the input side of the power flow. Later on, we'll discuss uh, where the forward and reverse clutch assembly is actually located on the Gen 1 system. The pulleys are not rotating in park or neutral. That provides less drag on the engine. The weight and load of the vehicle directly affects the secondary pulley. Uh, Fail-safe ratio is common on uh, if you have any kind of codes or solenoid failures on the primary up or primary down solenoids. The forward and reverse clutches can actually be heard activating until the clutch plates expand from heat. Uh, so when it's very cold, especially up in the northern areas, you may actually hear a little bit of the uh, clutch uh, plates moving until it warms up. The thing that's really unique about the Gen 2 is the valve body assembly is actually located on the top of the transmission under the cover. 
As you can see, they have this cover that goes over the top of the transmission. Underneath that cover, you'll find a plate with several bolts in it. And you can see the two connectors. One goes down to the main transmission, where the other connector for the solenoids actually goes right into that top cover. So if you remove the top cover, you'll see the connector here, the internal harness, and there's your valve body. Now the factory reminds you that when you're going to remove this valve body or the cover to clean this area real well before removing the cover. We don't want any dirt or debris actually getting down into the transmission. The other thing you'll notice is the pan is very shallow on the Gen 2. If you remove the pan, you'll see a very large filter there. Removing the filter only to find that you'll have a pulley and just a linkage uh, underneath the, uh, the transmission. You won't have a valve body located here. So if you get one of these in and you're not sure what you have and you actually drop the pan, uh, don't be surprised to see it like this if it's a Gen 2. Let's talk a little bit about how this transmission works. The driver can control the up and down shift through paddle switches on the steering wheel. Really nothing that abnormal. We're seeing more and more of that in today's market. But there's also a console-mounted floor shifter with a manual gate. There are actually three shift control modes that the driver can select, uh, which include obviously automatic, and then you have the manual mode and the temporary manual mode. In the automatic mode, it provides uh, ratios from 2.37 to 1 all the way up to 0.39 to 1. Now, the lowest range, uh, obviously from the lowest range to the overdrive ratio range, the transmission will actually shift like an automatic transmission. You may feel the shifts more in the manual mode. You may not feel the shifts very much in the automatic mode. What they call the less, less aggressive mode or the intelligent mode, it, the transmission changes to 6-3% uh, ratios. Now, using the paddle uh, switches on the steering wheel in the sport mode, or as Subaru refers to it as the sharp mode, the transmission can actually change up to as many as eight preset ratios. We'll kind of go over that in a minute. Now, when you're using the paddle shifter, you'll see a small LCD screen in between the speedo and the tachometer. That'll show you what range you've actually selected. Now, the manual mode provides six ratios, but you'll notice here in first gear, in manual mode, it's 2.18 to 1 where in auto mode it would actually take off to 2.37 to 1. So depending on how the vehicle is driven, there's actually eight ratios, but there's only six provided in different modes. You'll see here also in the manual mode in six gear, it's 0 0.40 uh, to 1, where in auto mode is 0.39 to 1. Now in the manual mode, uh, basically, we're going to put the shifter, as you can see here on the right, you'll shift it down and move it over to the manual mode. At that point, you'll take over with, by shifting it with the paddle buttons that you see here on the steering wheel. The one on the right will make the up shifts. The one on the left will actually make the down shifts. Now, temporary manual mode is when you put it in uh, auto mode and you're just driving it like normal. You have the shifter just straight down here in the, in the uh, D uh, position. Now, once you're in the D position in the auto mode, you can actually have temporary manual mode by just using the paddle buttons. So if you're in drive, uh, using it in automatic, you can actually go in temporarily upshift and downshift using the paddle buttons on the steering wheel. Subaru Lineatronic is a continuously variable transmission providing smooth, more responsive, and fuel-efficient gear changing. Power is transmitted from the engine to the torque converter, which has increased lockup for improved fuel economy, and onto a pair of adjustable V-shaped pulleys connected by a flat metal chain. In fully automatic mode, the width of both pulleys smoothly changes and the chain moves to the optimum gear ratio for the driving conditions. In manual mode, the driver can select one of the six predefined ratios using the paddles on the steering wheel to suit their specific driving situation. Unlike other CVT transmissions, the forward and reverse clutches on the Subaru Lineatronic are positioned after the variable pulleys, which also helps protect the gearbox from the torque feedback from the wheels. Smoother gear changing, more responsive.
better fuel economy. Subaru Lineatronic. Okay, so you can see by placing the clutch packs behind the uh, pulleys, uh, we're, uh, you know, handling that uh, feedback torque from the, uh, the wheels. Now, the secondary pressure or line pressure actually is the same on both pulleys at all times. The purpose of this is to be able to squeeze the chain together uh, between the pulleys and to keep the chain from slipping. Now, the primary pulley is going to get engine power through the input clutch, and a pretty unique input clutch on this transmission that we're going to show you in a little bit. Now, the TCM is not located in the valve body. It's actually located ex external from the transmission. The TCM basically sell, uh, signals the primary up solenoid that changes the ratio of the transmission. It does that by alterating the, uh, the pressure in the actual chamber that moves the pulleys back and forth. It's going to do that through the primary control valve, and uh, that will increase the primary pressure. Now, when they add pressure to the, the uh, chamber, it squeezes the pulley together, making the chain right up pulley, obviously this increases the diameter and changes the ratio. Um, at the same time, uh, it forces the secondary pulley apart, reducing that diameter, and we can have the chain moving in a, a nice straight uh, line during the uh, ratio changes. Now your handout may show the wrong figure on this particular slide. This is the correct figure, and I will show you in a moment how you can get the uh, updated handout material. The two pictures that you see here, this one and the following picture, were actually swapped in the original uh, printing, so that was a mistake made by us. I apologize for that. Uh, but you can see here that we're in the manual mode. The belt would be down here at the lower part of the pulley, and that's the 2.18 to 1. If it was in auto mode, it'd be 2.37 to 1, and that's the low gear ratio takeoff. The other thing I want to point out is you can see I've got a few pictures here of the chain. And these uh, pins that you see extending out from the chain, you can see they're on both sides. Those pins, as you can see in this drawing, actually ride on the pulley. So the pulleys have to have a tremendous amount of pressure to squeeze in on these pins uh, to keep the uh, actual chain from slipping. This is high gear ratio. As you can see, the pulleys have changed. Now the chain has gone up high on this pulley, uh, providing a six gear ratio of 0.40 in the manual mode and 0.39 to 1 in the auto mode. You will receive an email that will give you the updated handout material. You'll go to the red word here. You'll click on that, and you'll be able to download the updated PDF with the corrected uh, photos in it. Okay, as the vehicle slows down, obviously the TCM is going to change the signal to the primary down solenoid. Now the oil from that solenoid controls the primary down valve. That's going to dump the pressure through the switch valve, the uh, ratio switch valve. That pressure is going to drain from the ratio chamber. The uh, pulley spring force will take over on the secondary pulley. Uh, it's going to, uh, the spring squeezes the secondary pulley closed, and obviously that changes the diameter of the pulley. At the same time, it forces the primary pulley open. Uh, that's going to reduce the front pulley's diameter, and we're going to actually slow down to a lower gear ratio. Now, these ratios, like you've seen in that short video, they're pretty smooth in the auto mode. Uh, this keeps the engine in a, uh, engine RPM at a prime speed for uh, power and fuel economy. The construction of the transmission is basically in four main pieces. You have the bell housing here in the front. This will have the torque converter and the front differential here. And as you can see, this is the um, input shaft. It's a chain drive that goes to an uh, off-access pump. This is actually the input clutch. There's our two pulleys, and that's all part of the main case. Then you have an intermediate case. That's going to have your forward and reverse clutches. Like you mentioned in the video, the pulleys are up towards the front, and we actually have the forward and reverse clutches behind the pulleys. Now in the extension housing, just like any other Subaru you've ever worked on, that's where you're going to find your transfer clutch. This is a uh, cutaway explaining the, uh, the different components or showing the different components in this cutaway for the construction. 
You can see the input shaft here. It works off the primary reduction gear. Our input clutch would be in this area. There's our two pulleys uh, with our chain. And you can even see the off-access chain for the pump here. And then obviously our fold and reverse clutch is in the back. The transfer clutch. We have a drive gear that will transfer the torque to the front wheels. So this makes this an all-wheel drive. Now here's something unique about Subaru with this particular transmission. While the engine is actually being started, the rotating speed of the oil pump is not turning fast enough to provide a, any amount of oil uh, pressure to the input clutch. So the actually input clutch is not engaged yet. You start up the engine and basically the pressure will uh, start to build up in the pump and this keeps the transmission from causing any resistance to the, during, to the engine during startup. Now once the engine RPMs reach at least 400 or higher, the actual primary and secondary pulleys are actually filled with oil. Then the input clutch would be engaged. Again, this prevents the pulleys from turning until the clamping pressure on the train has been provided. Now once the, the clamping pressure is correct, we have the chain being held, uh, then the input clutch will be engaged. Now obviously the engine power is delivered to the pulleys uh, from the input uh, shaft to that input clutch by the reduction gear. Now when the pressure begins to increase, the secondary pressure uh, chambers of the, uh, there's pressure chambers that we showed you in those cutaways, kind of shows you where the oil is actually filled in for both pulleys. Now the other thing that the pressure is doing also is not so much just clamping down on the pulleys, the pressure is kept the same on both pulleys to keep the chain aligned throughout all the ratio changes. This is a color power flow uh, cutaway, kind of giving you an idea of exactly what I was showing you before. Uh, this is the input shaft, there's our reduction gear, you can see the uh, one of the speed sensors monitoring that. Uh, we're going right through our pulleys, right back to the transfer gear, and then obviously out through the output shaft or to the front wheels. This is a cutaway view showing you the actual power flow through the transmission. And I have another cutaway view here giving you a little bit of better identification of the uh, clutch assemblies that are involved. You can see the forward and reverse are right here. The reverse is actually splined in the case. Uh, we'll see that a little bit better uh, further on in the webinar. Our all-wheel drive system, we have the transfer clutch back here. And there's our input clutch. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about the input clutch itself. The whole assembly here, as you can see, is bolted to the bell housing. Once we unbolt this section, uh, you can see we have the input shaft, there's our input clutch drum, and there's our primary reduction gear. Now we have to remove this bearing to get the hub out. We remove the hub and bearing uh, in one piece. Uh, this hub actually freewheels until the clutch is applied. This is the actual input drum itself. And of course there's a bearing that's up inside this case right here that's on the back side of that reduction gear. Now what you're looking at here is the input clutch. And if you look closely you'll see that there's no friction material on this clutch. This is not a shifting clutch. Once it's applied it's on, it stays on until basically the engine is shut off. So there's actually no clutch material on that. It was one of the strangest things that we noticed about this transmission when we first took it apart. This red line going down the middle actually just to separate the reverse apply from the forward apply, the line that you see here is where the case actually splits. So the reverse clutches uh, are actually splined into the intermediate case that you see here. And the main case is where the actual forward drum will, will sit on top of this clutch because our planetary is in the middle. Now obviously in reverse the forward clutch is released. So the power flow goes through and it actually starts to turn the planetary. Once the reverse brake is engaged, the planetary is being held. Now in forward, forward clutch is applied, obviously the reverse is released. Then our power flow goes in the same rotation as input uh, through to the output shaft. If we hold the planet, we're going to turn everything the other way. Let me show you a little bit different uh, picture of that. 
<clears throat> this is the same idea. We have the forward clutch on, so our rotation is going to be the same because everything's turning in the same direction. Our ring gear, our output gear, and our planet all turn in the same way. Once the planet's being held by the reverse clutch, which is the brake clutch in the intermediate housing, that planet's being held. So as the outer gear turns, it rotates the actual planets, and then that will cause the output gear to turn in the opposite direction. <clears throat> Okay, this is the actual forward clutch assembly. We're looking at the uh, main case itself. If we remove the main case from uh, the intermediate case, you would, looking back at the main case, you'll see the planet assembly and the forward clutch. This is actually the intermediate case where it would be removed from. So this is the side of the case that would have been pulled away from that. And you still may have the, the drum just sitting on there. Uh, like we're showing you here, but this is actually what the forward drum looks like and it sits right up underneath that planet. Now just as get, we're going to disassemble the forward drum as you can see here in the upper right. Uh, there's our sun gear, our planet assembly, and we do have clutch material on this clutch because it is a shifting clutch. It's going, to clutch. it's going to be applied and released when we move the shifter, so it has clutch material on it. This is the reverse clutch. Again, I'm showing you a picture of how the forward clutch would be sitting down on top of it uh, with the planetary actually splined into these clutches. And you can see they're splined to the case, so that's obviously a brake clutch. You'll also find that there's a loop filter in here that should be changed during rebuild. Now this is the back of the intermediate case, this is the rear view of it. Basically all we've done is remove the extension housing. Uh, one of the things you want to make sure of, we don't lose the shims. Now these shims are all different in size, so each shim has to go back to where it came out of. We can't mix those up, so that's the transfer clutch that you see in the back of the unit. Uh, once we pull the transfer clutch apart, you'll see that there's a lube tube here, it's like a plastic tube. We don't want to damage or lose that. Also, we can see there's friction material on the transfer clutch also. I didn't have the reverse clutches laid out, but the reverse clutches also have material on those. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's talk a little bit about draining and filling <coughs> the main case. And this will be on the Gen 1 uh, type uh, unit. <clears throat> uh, first thing we're going to do is going to remove the drain plug. It has an Allen head on it, and this will be on the main case pan. We're going to drain all the CVTF type fluid out. We're going to replace the drain plug once the fluid stops dripping. We'll get, go ahead then and remove the pan, replace the filter, put the pan back on using some RTV sealant or equivalent. And now we're going to remove the actual fill plug, which is located on the back of the intermediate case. We're going to add uh, Subaru CVT-F type fluid until the oil starts to drip out. Once we've done that, we'll go ahead and start the engine. And we have to have a capable scan tool to monitor the fluid temp. This is nothing new. We've been uh, talking about this for the last uh, few years. Most of the transmissions today uh, have to be at a certain temperature to uh, get the correct fluid level. Uh, once we get the engine running, we're going to move this, uh, the shifter around from park to reverse and uh, back from drive to neutral. We're going to get the oil circulated uh, within the transmission. Once we've done that and we're at the correct temperature, we add fluid if necessary until it stops dripping out. Uh, once it does, you replace the seal that's actually on the fill plug and go ahead and tighten the fill plug up. This is the Gen 1. As you can see, this is the intermediate case here, and that's where your fill plug is located, just above the pan rail, and that's where it is. Now, there's the drain plug on the main case pan. 
and that's the type of fluid you're supposed to use. And you also have the fluid capacities uh, in the book for you. If you're working on a Gen 2, it's the same exact procedure. The only difference between the Gen 1 and the Gen 2 is the fill plug is on the main case, not on an intermediate case. It's just above the pan rail on the driver's side. <clears throat> As you can see here, this is where the fluid level will be once it stops dripping. Uh, we go ahead and put the fill plug back in at the correct temperature, and we're all set with that. If you drain and fill the front diff on the Gen 1, we're going to remove the drain plug it's, uh, using a T70 Torx fit. Now, this is at the bottom of the front differential. We drain all the gear oil out and place the drain plug. Uh, once the gear, uh, gear oil starts, stops dripping, tighten that down to specs. Then we're going to remove the check plug also located on the bottom of the front diff. And then we can go ahead and add uh, GL5 uh, gear oil, which is basically what we always refer to as 90 weight. One of the easiest ways to fill the differential on this is through the vent hole. And to do that, we have to remove the vent tube. And then we're going to go ahead and just add the correct capacity that we need. And until the oil starts to drip out, then we'll replace the check plug. This is the vent tube that I was speaking about. You can see it comes up here across to the top of the transmission. You can see a little closer look at it here. And we can remove this vent tube. Once we take it off, we can use that as a, as a place to locate uh, or to put our funnel in there and try to fill it up in that, that way. One of the uh, most common problems that we've seen so far with this transmission has actually been more of a uh, problem after it's been serviced at a uh, quick loop facility. They forget to fill the differential up, and it doesn't take very long before it completely wipes out the differential. The only difference between this and the Gen 2 is the fill plug is located on the driver's side just above the axle, and you can see the axle CV boot right here going into the transmission right at the front. Let's talk a little bit about the electronics. On the top of the transmission, you're going to find two main connectors. And uh, Subaru refers to the black connector as the T3B12 connector. Uh, that contains the wiring mainly for the inhibitor switch and the primary speed sensor. Now, the gray connector, Subaru calls that the T4B11 connector. That's going to have all your trans, uh, transmission solenoids, temp sensor. It's going to have the front wheel speed sensor and the secondary speed sensor there. <clears throat> this uh, connector also goes to the grounds. Now, the reason that we bring this up is if you're doing any diagnostics on this vehicle in, uh, in a transmissions in the vehicle, it's pretty easy to get to these compared to trying to get down to uh, some of the sensors on the side of the case. <clears throat> in your handout, you have the uh, connector views. So we give you the connector view for the black connector, and we identify all those pins. And then we also have the rain, senet, uh, rain sensor or inhibitor switch connector view also, and we give you a chart for that. Now, once we have the unit out, if it's on the bench, this will be really easy to access, and we can use this for some bench tests. <clears throat> this is where the rain sensor or inhibitor switch is located. It's on the driver's side. Uh, sort of in the middle of the case, the main case. And if you want to do some continuity checks, we have uh, the actual pin ID to do a continuity check either at the top connector, the T3, or at the rain switch itself. Uh, this is the T4 or gray connector. We have all the pinouts for you for this uh, in your handout for this also. This is actually the best place to test your temperature sensor. Um, if you're doing a check on the temp sensor, you'll see in a little bit why uh, it's easier to do it from here. Uh, when the unit is pretty, uh, pretty much cold at like 68 degrees Fahrenheit, you'll have about 2.5 ohms. And then once you get up to about 176, uh, you'll see uh, 330 ohms on the meter. This is the rest of the pins. Uh, located on that, that same connector. You should, this is in your, also in your handout. 
This is the internal harness that goes to the solenoids. The fluid temp sensor that I mentioned earlier is actually part of the harness, but it's not this harness that we're looking at. It's in between where the case harness comes into this one. In between in that harness is where you'll find the temp sensor. So that's why you do not see it listed here on this connector. And that's why we showed you uh, the pins IDs on the outside connector to be easier for you to check uh, the temp sensor from there. All the solenoids are fed uh, voltage from the TCM and they're grounded at the valve body. This is pretty crucial because you're going to make sure that these grounds are tight. They haven't been over twisted where the wires have been pulled out. Uh, the secondary uh, linear control solenoid and the forward and reverse solenoid are both linear type solenoids. The lockup duty primary up and down as well as the all-wheel drive transfer clutch solenoid, those are all PWM controlled. Uh, the solenoids are normally closed and they're actually interchangeable. The lockup uh, on-off solenoid is the only one that's different. Uh, it's just a basic on-off solenoid and that's normally closed also. Now let's take a look at where we can find uh, some of these sensors. The primary revolution sensor that you see here is located at the top of the case, which would go right in this hole here. And then the secondary oil pressure sensor is a three-pin uh, sensor. We've given you the pin out here and the voltage on each pin. Uh, that's located just below it in that hole right there. Now, the primary sensor is going to send a DC hertz signal to the TCM, and it monitors the primary pulley rotation. The secondary oil pressure sensor is also a three-wire uh, hall effect, giving the same type of uh, DC uh, hertz signal. Uh, with the key on, engine off, you'll see zero volts on the signal wire, which is pin two. Once we get the engine idling with no load, you'll see about 0.5 volts on that pin. And then if we power brake install the engine, uh, you see it should see as high as 4.5 uh, volts on that pin number two. This is the uh, location of the ground wires that I was mentioning. There's a couple of them right here at the case. You can see this one here and another one here that goes right to those connectors. Uh, and some of the sensors are also used using these grounds. Uh, so it's crucial that we make sure they're clean, uh, that, that the wires haven't been pulled on or pinched or anything like that. The secondary revolution sensor, again, this is the same as the others, three-wire hall effect, same DC hertz signal. And obviously that one's monitoring the secondary pulley rotation. And now what's unique about this next speed sensor, the front wheel speed sensor, it's the same as the others, three wire DC Hertz Hall effect, but it actually monitors output speed because it's looking at the transfer driven gear. So even though it's called the front wheel speed sensor, it's actually output speed that it's giving us. This is a typical TCM terminal, uh, terminal ID. Obviously, the year, make, and model you're working on, you want to check your Y diagrams and your pin IDs uh, through that. Uh, but we do have the, um, the A connector here, the B54, and also the B55. So there's two terminals uh, connectors on the uh, TCM. I've also listed in the handout all the diagnostic trouble codes. You have these on the next uh, on the three three pages on your handout. You also have uh, generic codes, and you also have factory specific codes. There is a TSB. This is probably one of the first ones that came out on this transmission, and it has to do with lockup. Uh, one of the things we did was we actually scanned the vehicle, took a movie snapshot of it. And if you look here, the front wheel speed sensor says miles per hour, because that is output speed. And sitting at right about 12 miles an hour, we looked at the lockup duty ratio, and it was already at 36%. This is not uncommon on some of the newer uh, transmissions in today's market. Uh, you'll find that they'll actually start pulsing lockup right after second or right even before second gear. Uh, you'll see a very uh, high slip rate. Uh, the clutch is actually being slipped. Uh, to save fuel. It'll do this as the ratios are going up and also it'll do it on coast down. Uh, so it's not unusual to have a clutch being pulsed, uh, pulsed on but slipping at a high rate as the vehicle also coasts down. 
And that's what this uh, TSP is basically addressing. If you have a feeling of uh, the engine RPM stumbling, coming to a stop, almost like not releasing the clutch on a standard transmission, uh, more than likely there's a problem internally on the, com on the converter itself. Uh, inside the converter, they used a bushing, uh, solid bushing type uh, washer. They've replaced that on the update to a needle bearing type. And this is what we're talking about on the washer. And one of the things that I noticed here was there's not much wear, uh, an area for wear. I mean, they're using this for uh, a loop channel, obviously on the top and the bottom. But if this start, really starts to wear down enough, I can see metal to metal contact here happening in this converter. So apparently now they've put a, uh, a torrenting bearing in here to try to uh, cure that problem of having that stumble feel once this washer starts to wear down and it actually uh, restricts the uh, lube flow to the converter. Like any other TSB, they always want you to verify the concern. Uh, they want you to go ahead and check the codes, go through several steps. There may be a point where you have to replace the converter and the valve body, so it doesn't surprise me here that we'll probably start finding uh, valve bodies wearing out on these also, just like everything else that we work on. And if you do any changes like the valve body, it may require a learning control procedure, and you can be able, you'll be able to find those in Mitchell's, all data, or Identifix. Uh, programs like that will have the relearn procedures in them. And that just about does it for today's presentation. Again, I want to thank uh, Seal Out to Market Products uh, for making this available to everyone. And I want to thank you all for attending. A uh, question I see up here, are any of the shims in the unit directional or dished? No, not as far as the shims go. They're just selective thicknesses, and you want to keep the shims uh, where they came out, the, the location they came from. Good question, though. If anyone else has a question, I don't want to end the webinar too soon. Please just go ahead and click on the little hand icon so that I know that you're uh, you're actually typing in uh, your question.